Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brainwaves. I'm Brandon Staglin, your host. Uh, you know, I've been doing this show for about five years now, almost five years. It's hard to believe. And if you've been watching this whole time, I want to thank you for your long-time support and your interest in learning about brain health research. Well, uh, I want to say one thing before I actually start our show today, and that is that I like to start learning from you, the viewer. Um, so if you have any suggestions about people or topics I can feature on the show and that you'd like to ask questions of online on our website, um, feel free to email me with those topics or people's names um, at brandon at imhro.org. Thanks. Now on to the show. So uh, today we have with us an amazing neuroscientist uh, named Dr. Beth Stevens. She's uh, at Harvard Medical School, and uh, she is part of a um, effort in a new uh, successful effort uh, to understand brain illness and how it develops in a new way. Uh, in 2015, she, with some colleagues, made an amazing discovery that there is a class of cells in the brain uh, that it has been so far pretty much ignored up until then uh, called microglia uh, that is very important in the development of brain illness. And she's here with us today to talk about her discoveries and what they might mean for folks with brain, uh, brain diseases and how they might be helped to recover based on this knowledge. So, so Beth, thank you so much for being with us on Brainwaves today. Thank you, Brandon. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. You're, you're welcome. It's great to have you on the show. So um, I wanted to first congratulate you on your MacArthur Foundation Genius Award that you received in 2015 for your research. Uh, that You're doing definitely important work, as, a, as that award uh, testifies to. Thank you. Yeah, it's been an exciting. It's been an exciting year. That was a, a surprise, and it's been a, it's been really exciting for both me and for my lab. Who, without them, I wouldn't have received the award. Well, great. Well, good for all of you then. Um, so you made this discovery, which I referred to before, that there's this class of cells in the brain called microglia that actually are part of the brain's immune system that are closely involved in the development of brain disease for what made you want to look at these cells and what did you discover about them and, and how has that developed since then? Yeah, sure. So, I, you know, people have known for a long time that these cells called microglia, which make up about 10% of the cells in your brain, we know these cells are, are there and actually there's been a lot of evidence that they change dramatically in a host of different diseases and brain injury. They become very activated or angry looking in the brains um, after a disease or infection or injury. But one of the things that wasn't really well understood is what they normally did, especially in the healthy brain during development when the brain is wiring up and connected. And uh, colleagues of mine in the field, um, Axel Nimron and also um, colleagues from Wen Biao Gan's lab, what they did is they took mice uh, where the microglia were labeled with a fluorescent reporter. So you could see the microglia in a mouse brain. And they just looked inside the brains by sh shaving off a little a window into the skull of a brain and put a microscope down. Um, and what they observed was really striking. And that was that these cells are constantly and dynamically serving the brain's environment. And one of the things that we notice they're really serving are synapses, are those connections between neurons. And what we discovered was, in fact, one of their major normal roles in development is, in fact, eating or engulfing these extra synapses. Now, during development, this is actually a really good thing because we're, we're born and we start out with too many synaptic connections. But through experience, a lot of these extra synapses get pruned away while others get strengthened and maintained. The idea is sort of use it or lose it. Synapses that are meaningful get strengthened and you keep them, but those that are less meaningful get pruned away. And this pruning process is what allows us to have precise brain wiring. And so you can imagine alterations in this process during development could have long-term consequences for brain connectivity and behavior. And that's thought to underlie neurodevelopmental disorders like autism and neuropsychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia. And so this brought together another finding. Um, when I was a postdoc in Ben Barris's lab at Stanford, we unexpectedly identified a role for a group of immune molecules called complement in this pruning process using the mouse visual system as our model. And when we looked in mice that lacked these complement molecules, pruning didn't happen normally, at least in the mouse's visual system. So this was evidence that these molecules called complement were necessary for pruning, or at least they were one of the sets of molecules that were necessary. 
Um, and so we started thinking about how this could be working. And this is what got really interesting, because at the time, as a developmental neurobiologist, I knew very little, to be honest, about immunology and how this all worked. But if you read about and learn about what's been shown in, in, in the immune system, a lot is known about complement. And one of its main roles in the immune system is to tag unwanted cells or bacteria for rapid removal by a class of cell called macrophages, which are essentially in the immune system are like the Pac-Man of the immune system. They're rapidly clear, eat these extra cells. Um, or these pathogens. So we put these two ideas together and thought, well, maybe what's happening in the developing brain is that these molecules called complement are tagging or binding these extra synapses, and one way they're getting removed is that the microglia, which have receptors for them, recognize those and then engulf those synapses. And we set out to test that idea. We developed a number of experiments and assays and indeed showed that microglia were engulfing synapses, and one of the ways they did it is through complement. And so we put, the, the model now is that in development, these complement molecules are binding to synapses, and it's one of the ways microglia know which synapse to prune and which ones not to prune. I, I've learned about pruning over the years and how that's a, a standard theory that's been had, that's been you know entertained and, and believed for quite a while that, that too much pruning in the brain can lead to symptoms of schizophrenia. And that's been shown, it's been shown that uh, the brain loses gray matter as schizophrenia develops, uh, which I believe is a loss of synapses, you know, uh, being, being seen in imaging. Um, but what you've discovered is, is a mechanism for actually how it happens. Uh, is that accurate? Yes. And that, again, all of this is done in the context of normal development using mouse as our model system. Now then taking that idea and then saying that it's involved in human brain disorders like schizophrenia and autism, that's a much bigger challenge, right? Because we can't go in and start to study this the way we can in animal models. And so this was a hypothesis. Um, and now what's very exciting to us is that there's now new genetic data and evidence that are implicating complement in schizophrenia. Um, and that led us to bring together these two ideas, right? So my colleague Stephen McCarroll at the Broad Institute and Stanley Center and HMS, he and his graduate student, um, Aspen Sekar, they uh, made an incredible discovery, um, which using human genetics discovered that individuals that carry a particular form of C4, which is one of the complement genes downstream of, in the same pathway we've been studying, that certain variations in, or var variants of this particular gene increases risk of schizophrenia. And they did a really beautiful uh, study that identified and honed in on this particular gene variant and its risk to schizophrenia. Now, around several years ago, when they had some early data indicating that this was the case, they, you know, they didn't yet at that time know much about complement and its role in, in the brain development. And that's what brought our labs together in collaboration with another uh, very excellent scientist, Michael Carroll, who's an immunologist here at Harvard, who's been studying complement in the immune system for his entire career, including C4. And that this brought together the three labs that came at it from very different perspectives with different expertise. And together now, we're setting out to test the hypothesis that too much C4, because of a variant like the C4A, could lead to too much complement, too much pruning, and that this might underlie some of the cognitive defects and other pathobiology in schizophrenia. Now this is a model, and we have quite a lot of work ahead of us to test this idea because, as you may know, there really are no good animal models or model systems to really test this right now. But our hope is that the genetics are really paving the way now paired with the biology that my lab and others have been studying for the last several years, and that these two together is going to allow us to develop better models to test this hypothesis, and also its relevance in human disease. So uh, I wondered, have you, have you speculated about uh, how um, these discoveries might lo long term improve the prospects for recovery for people with schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease and other, other brain disorders? And if so, how do you envision that happening? Right. Well, I should say um, that you know, schizophrenia, I think we're a ways away from thinking about um, complement in terms of a treatment or, or a therapy, uh, because we still have quite a lot of work to do to, to try to develop uh, the biology there. On the other hand, we have independently been ex exploring 
uh, the role of complement and microglia in other brain disorders and other brain diseases. And what we've found and what we've shown uh, this year is that it's, there's also uh, a role for complement and microglia in Alzheimer's disease, at least in Alzheimer's models. Um, and what I think um, is exciting to us is the idea that a hallmark of so many brain disorders, ranging from schizophrenia, autism, to Alzheimer's disease, um, involves the loss of synaptic connections. And this made us wonder, could there be some common denominators or common pathways, despite the fact that all of these diseases are quite different, if we could manipulate those common pathways and protect the synapses, this could have long-ranging implications. So we decided to, to really tackle this, um, and the idea was that synapse loss happens many, many, in a, in, a, in a human, many, many years before you start to see the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease and also the cognitive defects. So that there may be a window where one could go in and manipulate this pathway and slow the progression of synapse loss. And if so, could that, could that protect not just synapses but also cognitive function? So in collaboration with Dennis Selko, who's a scientist uh, pioneer in this field of Alzheimer's disease and A-beta, and my um, postdoctoral fellow, Soyeon Hong, who is a, is a former graduate student with Dennis, she put a brought our labs together to tackle this question in the context of Alzheimer's. And what we found pre pretty remarkably is that if you look at the very earliest time um, over the, in, in disease, before progression has really gotten uh, started, we see a striking upregulation of complement proteins and its binding to synapses not everywhere in the brain, but in vulnerable brain regions like the hippocampus, regions that are involved in memory. And when we zoomed in, it looked a lot like what we saw in development, meaning complement was tagging these synapses, and the microglia are more activated, and again, we had evidence that they were eating too many synapses. So using a combination of genetic strategies and a blocking antibody, we showed that if we treat the mice with things that block complement, or its receptors on the microglia, we could slow the progression of synapse loss. So this was really exciting because this was a proof of principle uh, that if we manipulate this pathway, we could have a beneficial effect on synapses. And now we're looking and applying this uh, idea to other models of neurodegenerative disease and other models of disease in general because we have now the tools and the assays to start to interrogate some of these questions. The hope is because these animal models are a bit further along, we can really dig into mechanism and to start to ask things like, what triggers this to begin with? What's the upstream regulator? What's triggering complement in those vulnerable brain regions? That's a really important question. If we could stop that, we might be able to slow the whole thing. What's complement binding to its synapses? We don't know what that is yet. <clears throat> so now that's what we're, our lab's working on, is trying to better understand the mechanism. Because if we really understand the specificity and the mechanisms, this might lead to new um, novel uh, therapeutic targets um, that, th that later could be um, hopefully uh, in, uh, relevant to disorders like schizophrenia and autism and disorders that are much harder to tackle. Sounds great and very hopeful. Um, so I've heard you use the expression go for it in <laughs> describing your approach to research on a couple of occasions. Uh, why is audacity in brain health research such an important asset uh, today? Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's really important to go for the really big questions. Um, often they're hard, um, and but if you you can't we can't do incremental science if you want to make huge impact, right? So I think if you have an important question that you think could have broad implications, you have to go for it. Um, however, you can't go for it often alone. There's just not enough funding out there. There's not enough expertise for one lab to tackle such huge questions, right? So this is where collaborations, interdisciplinary collaborations come in to play. Um, and that is really what's, um, I think, catalyzed a lot of our work is that we've teamed up with people like at the Broad and other areas at Harvard. I'm here at Children's Hospital. It takes a village, right? It takes a multi, it's a multi-task, a multi-team effort to try to make uh, an impact on an important health question and biological question. And I think uh, you have to sort of have that mentality though. You have to go for it if you wanna, if you wanna make an impact. And it's a lot more fun also. <laughs> that's great. Uh, that's that's a, a 
big tenet of what our, our sister uh, nonprofit One Mind is all about, uh, fostering open science and collaboration amongst neuroscientists to get to the big answers to the big questions more quickly. Exactly. Thank you for all your uh, very insightful and, and uh, original answers to these questions. Uh, if viewers have any questions for you on the Brainwaves um, Q&A feature after I post this broadcast on our website, are you ready to answer some questions? Absolutely. I'd be very happy to. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Look forward Beth. to it. Good. <laughs> good, good. Beth, thanks so much for being on Brainwaves today, and I uh, hope to talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks so much, Brandon. Take care.